blessing to praise the Lord in such a way. Let's uh, think for a few moments on John chapter 19, beginning at verse 19. It says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity we have today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us from his death the significance. Lord, help us to learn from you today what a wonderful miracle it is that we have forgiveness and salvation and hope for glory because of all that Christ did for us on that cross. Lord, then help us to take that good news to those who don't know, to those who scoff at it, to those, Father God, who are doomed without you. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jesus Christ, you might remember, was first introduced to the people by John the Baptist as he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The last introduction of Jesus was performed by Pilate, the Roman governor. In presenting Jesus to the mob who clamored for his crucifixion with these words, Behold your king. Pilate said far more than he realized with those words. Behold your king, rather cowardly Roman governor, who failed to perceive that Jesus was indeed the king of kings, the Lord of lords. More than likely, he spoke these words of truth concerning Christ out of scorn for the Jewish people whom he hated. It was the common custom in those days when a criminal was executed that a brief description uh, of the charge for which he'd been condemned be written on a board and placed on the cross above his head so that passerbys might know what had brought this individual to such an end. Pilate had an inscription made which was printed in three languages and placed on the cross of the dying Redeemer. The inscription, of course, we know read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Why was the charge written in those three languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew? Probably the reason was to make sure everyone in the crowd could read it, who could read it. Jerusalem was packed with visitors at this time of the year from all parts of the world. And, but another, another hand than Pilate's, well, I think, was also in this writing on, on, on all these different languages. It was the hand of God. Because Greek, Latin, and Hebrew were the three great languages of the world at the time, and each of them represented an era of history. Each symbolized a great world movement. The Greek, of course, the language of culture and science, was the language of educated folks. God was proclaiming that Jesus was king over the realm of culture. Latin was the official language and language of the civil law and politics of government of the Roman Empire. And God was proclaiming Jesus to be king over the realm of of government, and Hebrew, of course, was the national language of Palestine, was the language of revealed religion, and was therefore the language of the law of the prophets. And God was proclaiming Jesus to be king in the realm of religion, in the realm of spirit. Today, culture and education and law and government and religion and ethics should behold the reverence and worship that we should hold for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. With a spirit diametrically opposed to that which Pilate had, that is, a spirit of utmost respect for him who was crucified rather than scorn. I urge you to consider seriously this morning Christ's title. We need to behold our King in his full glory. First of all, behold your King in the councils of eternity. You'll no doubt recall how John the Apostle said it in the, the Gospel, In the beginning was the Word, 
And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and beheld, and, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Apostle John, in, in philosophical terms, tells us that the eternal God, who before time began, spoke and called light to shine, and, and in time clothed himself in human flesh and, and walked the face of the earth as a man. Neither his life nor his death on the cross was an accident. It's a part of God's plan all along. From before the foundation of the world and the councils of eternity, it was ordained that Jesus Christ should be our king. I read about a Jewish soldier who many years ago now had been attending services where he heard of the character and teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he went to his own rabbi and he said, Rabbi, the Christians say that the Christ has already come while we claim he is yet to come. Yes, the rabbi assented. Well, asked the, the young soldier, when our Christ comes, what more than Jesus can we expect? But indeed, since Jesus Christ was fully God, fulfilled so many prophecies, all of them. The Bible tells us that Jesus was, the, was approved by God himself as his son in whom he was well pleased. But let's go back to the beginning of Jesus for a minute. Secondly, behold your king in the manger cradle. The babe in, in Bethlehem's manger was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The wise men, you recall, came seeking saying, Where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. And the angelic hosts announced his birth by means of a heavenly anthem. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. A poet said it like this, I do not know how that Bethlehem's babe could in the Godhead be, I only know the manger child has brought God's life to me. Next you see you need to behold your king among the crowds. And in Matthew 9.36 it says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. When the king stood in the presence of, of human need, human sorrow, his heart was filled with sympathy and his eyes were a fountain of tears and, and he didn't turn his ears or his eyes away from the world's <coughs> needs and the troubles of the world. Jesus was deeply moved by the spiritual depression of the people. They fainted, it said. The kingly Christ was deeply disturbed by this, by this spiritual destitution that the people were in and, and they were scattered abroad as a sheep having no shepherd. The kingly Christ sees, seeks, and sympathizes with shepherdless souls today, and the Bible assures us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Next, we need to behold our king in the classroom. The officers in the temple admitted in John 7, 46 to the chief priests and Pharisees, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. In Matthew 7, 29, it says of Jesus, He was teaching them as one having authority and not as one of their scribes. Jesus, who was a kingly teacher, came to lead men to a true and complete knowledge of the character and purpose of God. In John 14, 8 and 9, the Bible says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? And in John 1.18, we find these words, No one has seen God at any time. 
the only begotten God, God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. Jesus reveals our duty toward God in Luke 10, 27, and He answered them and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus taught us the science of successful human relations in Matthew 7, 12. He says, In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law of the prophets. This applies man to man, man to woman, woman to woman, husband to wife, parent to child, employer to employee, any relationship you care to name. I understand that in front of the great cathedral of Amiens stands a statue of Christ. And on either side are his twelve apostles. Below them are written their greatest virtues in contrast to their greatest vices. In, in Peter's case, his outstanding quality is his courage. But below it, you see a figure of Peter fleeing from a leopard, representing Peter's cowardice. And then beneath that, you see the same figure sitting on a leopard and, and riding forth the conquest. The sculptor wanted to teach us that by sitting at the feet of the Lord Jesus and learning from Him, the very thing which is a, a, an individual's weakness can be transfigured into their strength. That the very thing from which he fled can become the glorious chariot on which he rides forward, conquering and to conquer. So we've seen so far that we need to behold our King in the councils of eternity, in the manger cradle, among the crowds, in the classroom, and then next, behold your King upon the cross of Calvary. What we are dwelling upon and the result of that on this day. Here we come to the central purpose of His coming into the world. That at the cross, sin's seriousness is disclosed. At the cross, the justice of God is revealed. God is holy and just and must punish sin. At the cross, the love of God is demonstrated. At Calvary, our sins were suffered for. At Calvary, we see the basis for God's hope for a redeemed race. He has no other plan. Here we make the decision that determines our eternity, our destiny. Paul Harvey one time told the story of S.D. Gordon, who was a Boston preacher, he used a beat up, rusty birdcage one Sunday morning to illustrate his sermon. He sounds like my kind of preacher. First he explained how he'd come by the cage that he had there, saying when he first saw it, it contained several miserable small birds and it was carried by a boy of about 10 years old. Curious, he asked the young man what he was going to do with the birds, which he had obviously trapped. The little boy said, well, I'm going, to, I'm going to play with them and have some fun with them. But after that, the preacher asked, Oh, I've got some cats at home and they like birds. <laughs> well, compassion tugged at the minister's heart and he asked the boy what he'd take for the birds. The little boy was kind of surprised that anybody would have offer him something for these birds. He says, Mister, you, you don't want to buy these birds. They're ugly. Just field birds. They don't sing or anything. Nevertheless, Dr. Gordon persisted and soon struck a bargain with the boy for the birds. And at the first opportunity he had, once the boy was out of sight, the pastor released the poor little creatures, gave them their freedom. After explaining the presence of the empty cage there in his auditorium, Dr. Gordon then told another story, this time about how Satan had boasted that he'd trapped, he'd baited a trap and caught a world full of people in. What are you going to do with them? Jesus asked him. I'm going to play with them. Tease them. Make them marry and divorce and fight and kill one another. I'll, I'll teach them to throw bombs at each other, Satan replied. When you get tired of playing with them, what will you do with them next? 
Jesus asked. Condemn them, Satan answered. They'll, they're no good anyway. Jesus then asked Satan what he would take for them. The devil said, you can't be serious. They just spit on you. They hit you and hammer nails into you. They're just no good. How much? The Lord can answer. All your tears and all your blood. That's the price. Satan said gleefully. Well, we know that Jesus paid the price. Took the cage and opened the door. Finally this morning, we shall all behold the King coming in the clouds. In John 14, verses 1 through 3, Jesus says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And after Jesus ascended into heaven following the resurrection, the angel came to the disciples and he said in Acts 1.11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who's been taken up from you into heaven will in just this come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. And we find these words in Revelation 1-7 concerning his return. It says, Behold, he's coming in the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. The day is coming. When the same words that Pilate had written above the cross of Calvary are going to be sung around the throne, not in Greek or Latin or Hebrew, but by people from all nations in the perfect language of heaven. Are you ready for Christ's return? In northern Italy, a tourist found this beautiful picture of what it means to be expectant of Christ's return. At the Villa Escanati, Along the shore of Lake Como, he was introduced to a friendly old man who was the caretaker of the castle's garden. The grounds were immaculate, and the gardener was doing everything he could to further improve their beauty. And to his surprise, the tourist discovered that the owner of this castle hadn't been on the property in 12 years. He was rather confused by the man's compulsion for perfection when the owner hadn't been there in over a decade. So he said to him, You keep these gardens in such fine condition just as though you expected your master to come tomorrow. The gardener was very prompt in his reply, Today. Today. Expected him to come today. That groundskeeper had the expectancy that every one of us should have. Jesus could come today. Are you looking for his return tomorrow? Or today? I beseech you this morning, I encourage you, I beg you to make Jesus your king today. Let the Lord of indescribable love become the master of your heart. I, I close with this thought. There's one term in the account of the crucifixion and resurrection of the Lord Jesus that is seldom, if ever, referred to in any depth anyways. Namely, his seamless robe. In John's Gospel, it says the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. In the Bible, garments speak of conduct or of a display of character. A good example would be the, the words from 1 Peter 5, be clothed with humility. What precious truths about Jesus can we learn as seen in his seamless robe? Our Lord was flawless, absolutely beyond reproach in his character. He is 
according to Hebrews 7, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. There's no scene dividing his meekness from his anger, his gentleness from his firmness, his authority from his charm, his mercy from his sincerity. He is uniquely beautiful in his character. The robe is all one piece, and we see him compassionate but inflexible, full of truth, yet full of grace, and, and come to save, yet come for judgment, eating in the upper room, and yet sitting at the table with publicans and sinners. All is done with uniform consistency. Nothing is ever out of perspective. Power is without pride. Knowledge is without superiority. And authority is without arrogance. It, it, his, his robe is woven on the loom of eternity. John Les saw that seamless robe in the hands of gamblers near the cross. They were gambling for it. How he must have been stirred when he was in the spirit of the Lord's day and he saw Jesus clothed in a robe reaching to the feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash with the name upon it, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we, his redeemed, are clothed with garments of salvation and wrapped with a robe of righteousness, we must fall at his feet during this time we have of remembering the resurrection to, to worship, to praise, to cry out to God for an experience of the power of his resurrection in order that we might be genuine reflectors of the wondrous character of our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to sing a song. Christ is risen today. Do you believe that? You need to shout it from the rooftops this coming week that you serve a Savior who's not dead in a tomb, but He's alive and He's in your heart. You need to make a decision for the Lord. I'll be down here to receive you. Let's all of us stand together and commit to the Lord as we sin. As we confess our sins, repent, turn from Him, turn to Him. And that's glorious. That's marvelous. And that's the good news you can share. Let me close this with prayer before we go. Like, no service this evening. Uh, worship with your family. Have a, a blessed Easter meal. And uh, remember your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you saw our need, Lord. You saw us in our sin and you had pity and mercy. Lord God, you could have just given up on us, but instead you loved us enough to send your only begotten Son to die that cruel death on the cross. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for that love. Lord, help us. Help us with our pride and our arrogance when we, when we think we're not that bad to recognize how really bad our sins are. Help us, Lord, to turn to you and to repent, Lord, to turn from those sins and and to live the, the kind of holy life you, you want us to live. Lord, you want us to be like you. Lord, help us day by day to resist Satan's temptations, Lord. And to depend upon you and, and to rely upon your presence every second in our lives. Father, help us to share the good news with those who don't know. Those who are our friends and our family those we care about, Lord, and they're on that road to destruction. Lord, remind us every day that that's, that's our responsibility to share what we can. Father God, we just uh, are basking in, in your love and in the majesty of Christ. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.